It's my pleasure and my privilege to welcome you to the Broadway this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nick. I'm one of the members here. And Mr. Rochelle is away on holiday at the moment, um, but she'll be back up Sunday, so as they used to sell the TV, normal service will be resumed shortly. Hopefully you have seen a notice sheet either in email form to you or we have some printed copies at the back telling you what's on. And please do stay afterwards, unless I've so offended that you want to be either before the end or at the end quickly. Uh, it would be super to say hello to you later on and to share refreshments with you. We come from different places to meet with God together. For some, it will be a return to a familiar place. Perhaps others are here for the first time. For some, it's been a week of joy. For some, sorrow. For many, a week of dull routine. But we meet now in the presence of the one who brought order out of chaos, the light of the world, the one who says, you are loved. This is a time when you can bring all you are carrying and lay it down, at least for a while, to receive rest, encouragement and healing and strength for what lies ahead. To help us do that, we're going to start by saying the Lord's Prayer together as a way of bringing our scattered senses to a focus on God, who is here amongst us by His Spirit. And we'll say it slowly. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us.
Has anybody watched The Crown? Yeah, so you've got a Netflix subscription? Yeah. Okay, what's that? Fog. Fog. Features heavily in The Crown, doesn't it? It's about the only truthful thing in it, but there we are. Okay, next one, please. I've learned the Makaton. Simon. What's that? Snow. 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 Won't be long before it's snowing, will it? Hey? We look forward to the snow in our house because that's when we put the central heating on. <laughs> At least that's what my wife says. Okay, the snow. Mm. And what's this one? Oh, some uncertainty. Never be uncertain when you come into Broadway Church. Because people think, what's he trying to get at? <laughs> oh. No. <laughs> but it could be. It could be. No, it's something much more kind of mundane than from the store. Clouds. Clouds. 
body wears the heart. Can we have the next one, please? Oh, what's that? I actually thought that one in was a joke. We talk about everything being in the cloud nowadays, don't we? That's a data center in Cardiff. So that's full of computers that hold cat videos and all the other stuff that's in the cloud. But next picture. I want to talk today about clouds, old fashioned clouds. The real sort of clouds, the ones you see in the sky. Now we've already seen the picture that says what clouds are called when they're on the ground. Can any of the young people remember what a cloud is when it's really brown? Fog, did you say? Yes. It's called fog. And I want the older people to remember that, even if you don't think you're older. Most people prefer sun to clouds. And a quick show of hands, who prefers clouds to sun? Okay, so three people. So I think the majority of people here prefer it when it's sunny. You sometimes hear people say, oh, I'm under a bit of a cloud at the moment. Or, look at him, he looks as though he's under a bit of a cloud. But perhaps we shouldn't be so disappointed. Because in the Bible, clouds get top billing. It's in the cloud that God turns up. Now we believe that God's everywhere, not just in clouds. But sometimes the Bible writers have to find a way of putting words around something which is really difficult to put words around describe something which, in many ways, is indescribable. Near the beginning of the Bible, there's a story about how God, he, God led people to a new home by means of the cloud. It was something they could see, and all they had to do was follow it. And in the Bible story that we'll be looking at later in the service, for those who are staying in, we'll be reading about what happened. Jesus went up a mountain. This is what it says. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Serious man. And it goes on. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them. So fog. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud and said, This is my son whom I have chosen, listen to him. So that's a really important moment when they got a glimpse of who Jesus was and how amazing he was. And you may not get a moment like that very often, if at all, but you will see lots of clouds. And when you do, you can remember that story. I wanted to find a hymn that fitted in with this bit of the service, and our next one reminds us of way that Jesus looked up on that mountain. This is a hymn hopefully lots of you will know. And after we've sung it, we're going to pray for our young people as they live for their groups. So if you're willing and able, please stand as we sing, Shine, Jesus Shine.
Let's pray for our young people. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the young people here today. Yes. Thank you for the privilege of sharing your story with them and help us to be good friends to them in the coming days. May they know that they are valued for who they are, most especially by you. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Trish has a notice for us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Trish. Uh, this is the third and final calling, as they might say, um, for this boarding. Uh, we are actually uh, looking for a treasurer. Uh, and within the church, the treasurer needs to be a trustee and therefore needs to be a deacon. Uh, so this is a formal process. Uh, the process is for members only. So only a member can be nominated, only a member can nominate, and only a member can second uh, this post. That doesn't mean to say that we're not asking everyone, please, to prayerfully think about this matter going forward, whether you're a member or not. Any member of the church may propose any other member of the church, but please make sure that you have the permission of that person to be nominated. Uh, that person who is nominated needs to prayerfully consider the responsibilities of Treasurer's Deacon, as outlined in our booklet. Each nomination needs to be, needs to be entered by a proposer, and a seconder. As I said before, all of them need to be church members. And today is the last day for any nominations to go up on the board. The board is at the back of the church, clearly uh, signed. Um, after today's service, uh, I will draw a line, literally, underneath anybody who's actually been uh, proposed. Okay? Um, the matter will be uh, the, this will remain up here until Sunday the 17th, which is the last Sunday before we have our church members meeting on the 20th of September, when we will actually vote for this post. The, pers the position of Treasurer Deacon is considered to be a regulated person under the Criminal Justice and Court Service Act 2000, and it would be a criminal offence for anyone banned from working with children or vulnerable adults under this Act to allow themselves to be nominated for the diaconate. Just so that you all know that one. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Trish. I should say I did ask Trish to spin that bit out. It's a bit short of material this morning. But I feel that you're at the coffee too soon. Only, only joking, actually. The opposite is true. It's said that you should leave your comfort zone every so often, because it's good for you. Well, that's certainly the case for me this morning, and it will be interesting to know if you feel the same at the end. So buckle in, and we'll start. Yeast. <laughs> Only joking. It will come as a little surprise to you now, given the all age talk preamble, that the theme this morning is clouds. I had an idea, as one does, based around clouds, and I looked for a Bible passage that I could use. Transfiguration came up in a Google search. Bible passages involving clouds, and I thought, if that's got a cloud in it, that'll do. <laughs> and then the head scratching will begin. You may be aware that I'm not a biblical literalist, and there's something so out of the ordinary about the account, or should I say, the account of the Transfiguration, because it's in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. I might have been tempted to look for something else, something more straightforward. And I know the Bible is full about out of the ordinary stuff. The 
whole point of God's story. <laughs> but this particular passage can be a bit of a struggle for those that are burdened, or should I say blessed, by 600 years of Western scientific rationalism. So back to the books, as well as the book, to see what can be learned from this particular episode. And what follows is a partial, seen through a glass darkly, interpretation. There's a saying that you sometimes get on internet comments, which is, your mileage may, may differ, your route may be different, your conclusions about something may be different, and that's fine. This is just my take. Roger is very shortly going to be bringing us our reading, and it's worth setting the reading about transfiguration in a wider context, and that's what we'll try to do. And I think, as a wider point, it's worth setting biological stories in the wider context. The Bible and the Gospels are not journals as such, it's not a diary. On Tuesday we went to the mountain, <coughs> on Wednesday we fed 5,000 people. It's not designed to be read like that. And there's a temptation sometimes to look at a story in isolation rather than seeing what comes before it and what comes after it. It's part of a wider narrative. If you read the Gospel accounts, the journey of Jesus and the disciples up to this point has been full of signs and wonders. He's just fed at least 5,000 people. The disciples have been sent out to do the stuff. Everything has been going pretty well, notwithstanding obviously what happened to John the Baptist. And it's it's quite a long reading that we're going to hear. So please make yourself comfortable and I'll invite Roger to come and read. Morning. The, the reading is taken from the Gospel according to, to St. Luke, chapter 9, starting at verse 18 and going on to verse 36. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who did the crowd say that I am? And they replied, Oh, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, God's Messiah! Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anybody. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised again. <coughs> then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to lose their life for me will save it. And what good is it for someone to gain the whole 
world and yet lose or forfeit her very self. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be shamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not test, taste death before they see the kingdom of God. <laughs> About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendour, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which was about to bring to fulfilment at Jer Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they came, became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as the men were leaving, Jesus, Jesus, when they were leaving Jesus, uh, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud, saying, This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roger. There can be few things more likely to induce a feeling of despair than the dreaded words, Would you like to see my holiday pictures? <laughs> I can see one or two people shuffling in their seats. We've all been there, haven't we? Getting ready to ooh and ah as appropriate while fighting off the feelings of envy. Boredom. Free from the constraints of physical film, where the 24, or if you were really well off, 36 exposures had to be rationed through a week's holiday. Holiday pictures can now easily run into the hundreds of images. So, preamble over, I ask you, would you like to see my holiday pictures? <laughs> A few months ago, June and I were fortunate enough to go on holiday to Italy and to visit our favourite place, a city where the streets are paved with water, Venice. And here's my favourite picture from an earlier trip to Venice. I was talking to June about the trip and said that Venice had less canals than Birmingham, and she immediately corrected me. She said, that's not right. I think you mean it has fewer canals than Birmingham. <laughs> that's a joke anyway. Okay? <laughs> safe now, carry on. Venice isn't just famous for its canals, but also has produced some great artists. One of the most famous was a chap called Giovanni Bellini. 
at a time when many people were unable to read. The painting of the Bible story was a great way of reinforcing the message preached in churches. And you don't have to spend a lot of time in Italian art galleries to realise that Bible students were where the money was. <coughs> Mr Bellini, or presumably Signor Bellini, was no different when it came to making a living. And he beamed away from his studio in Venice and produced this painting sometime around 1480. And this is one of the Bellini transfigurations. I will be honest, it's not exactly the sort of thing I want hanging on my wall for several reasons. But we'll pause the art appreciation class for a few minutes and go back to the passage. It starts instantly enough. Of course, we read the Gospel accounts knowing the whole story whereas Peter didn't. Jesus appears interested in who people think he was. It's not quite that straightforward though, I think, because he's teeing Peter up at this point. And perhaps asking the same of us. So for a moment, I want you to imagine you're sitting there next to Peter, up on the mountain, and Jesus turns his gaze to you and asks you the most important question you will ever hear. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? What are you going to say? Are you going to say that it's complicated, that it's nuanced, that 2,000 years of human progress and the aforementioned 600 plus years of Western scientific rationalism have not made it easy to answer? Or do we answer as simply as Peter does? He is the Messiah. In a sense, all we can ever do as a church is to help people answer that question by the way we live and serve them. And then, bang! Jesus drops the news onto the disciples. The harsh reality wants to come. It's not all going to be signs and wonders and everything being lovely. Yes. Peter, yes, us, you might accept who I am, but are you ready to accept all that entails? Talk about an emotional roller coaster. And then a bit later, Jesus and a few of the disciples go up the mountain. And this amazing thing happens. Peter wants to freeze it. He wants to press pause on the Netflix transfiguration. He wants to freeze frame it. But the Gospel account is that almost as soon as the thing happened, it was over. And then it's back down to reality. I don't know how long what happened on that mountain sustained Peter, but I think it had a lasting effect. He writes about it in the second letter, or whoever wrote the second letter, Peter writes about it. So it's something that stayed with him and with his close companions. The transfiguration and that subsequent journey to Jerusalem shows the absolute commitment of Jesus to, as the song says that we haven't sung, lay aside his majesty and walk towards death on the cross. And walk away from Satan. And walk away from glory. And walk 
of sacrifice to the greater God. So in a way, if you want to sum the transfiguration up in a few words, it's a massive reality check. The reality of who Jesus is, that he's seen in the glory of God. And the reality of what living in obedience really means. But of course the disciples only find that out later on. I promise you some art appreciation, so I'll get back to the art appreciation class. So let's have another look at the Bellini painting, if we may. Now, I better put this out there straight away. I am no painter, at least not on this scale. Walls, skirting boards, doors, that sort of stuff, absolutely all day long. Artistic stuff, not really my bag. I think it was Dr. Johnson who said, you don't need to be a carpenter to know whether a table has been well made. I don't think that Mr. Bellini has really captured the scene particularly well. Just saying. In fact, I think it's tempting to say that Mr. Bellini didn't even bother reading the Gospel accounts. I think somebody's told him what it should look like. And he said, yeah, I think I know what you want. Because the mount that they're on looked distinctly flat. You can see mountains at the back, but they're not on the mountain. And even allowed for the fact that it's painted in 1480 or thereabouts, and paint will fade, Jesus could hardly be described as shining like the sun. His clothes do not, to my way of thinking, look as bright as lightning. And if you look to the left of the painting, you probably won't be able to see this, you can from here. There's a bloke looking after some cows, which is a detail conspicuously missing from the gospel here. <laughs> People talk about stuff, you know, being edited out of the gospel. Clearly, the bloke with the cows were. It makes you wonder what there is in other stories. We've edited them into the manger scene, but we've edited them out of the transfiguration. So, I, I don't know, I just. It leaves me scratching my head slightly. And you can sort of imagine the conversation that took place when Mr. Bellini was there with the easel and the painting under the cloth. And then the client came in and Is it ready? Yes, it's ready. And uh, Mr. Bellini says, Are you ready to see it? Yes. He pulls the cloth off. And the client again, Mr. Bellini, of course, not yet got his fee, would be saying, everything satisfactory? Uh, well, it looks a bit ordinary. It just looks a bit ordinary. I still want to pay him, said Mr. Bellini. <laughs> I think actually by accident or design, Mr. Bellini has told us something very, very important about the nature of the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain. Because whatever happened on that mountain, whatever happened that's captured in words that are trying to describe the indescribable, it was intimately tied to what happened after the sleep. In the rest of the life for Jesus and for us. Because following Jesus isn't all, and you may have heard this phrase before from me, it isn't all beer and sandwiches. It's not about basking in the glory of God. It's the way of holding back. It's the way of service. 
It's the way of turning the other cheek. It's the way of giving them a spare coat. I could go on about how they perform. That's not to say that there aren't high points, moments of deep connection, but we don't stay there. Life isn't lived up the mountain. It's mostly lived in the valley, in the fog. And we'll turn to that after our next hymn and our prayers for others. So if you're willing and able, please stand as we sing. Thank you. 
Please be seated. John's going to bring us our prayers for others. And he's going to pray for back. Thank you, John. <coughs> I see prayer as a conversation with God and I invite you this morning to join us in this conversation. Let us pray. <coughs> well Lord, here we are again, another Sunday, another Sunday service, another pause for intercessions, also known as prayers for others. It doesn't seem that long since I last led them, about a month ago, I think. <clears throat> In fact, my turns come around once a month this year, and sometimes it feels a bit like a monotonous regularity. I do try to play, pray imaginatively with different ideas and themes, but basically it's the same list of needs I come up with every month. Always Ukraine, often new areas of conflict like Nagorno-Karabakh in Azerbaijan. There's no shortage of wars to pray about or parts of the world which are short of food. I pray about climate change, the destitute and the homeless of Darwin, a fractured society, a struggling health service. So for today's prayer, I might as well have dug up my notes from last month, or, or the month before that, or, or even January. It won't have changed that much, if at all. The world is still at war. I usually refer to it as warring madness at some point. We've seen dreadful reports from Ukraine in this last week. It only gets worse. There are still hungry people. The world continues to get hotter or the climate gets more volatile. The number of homeless here increases as the number of hitting poverty levels, struggling to cope with life. The health service waiting lists get longer. Lord, I've got to be honest, sometimes praying seems pointless. At the very least, I could use last month's prayers for all the good it seems to do. Nothing seems to change. The world remains such a difficult place for so many people. But, hmm. but Lord, didn't you tell us stories about this sort of situation? About that person who was entertaining, entertaining his friends. He ran out of food, so he rattled the door of a friend until they got up and gave them something for the guests. Or there was the story of the persistent widow. She went to the church again and again and again and until she got justice. Lord, you taught us to pray, you told us encouraged us, you told us to carry on praying, praying for things other than ourselves, with phrases like, thy kingdom come. Be persistent was what you said, and you were also saying that we should not be introspective in our praying, that we should not be concentrating on our own interests and concerns. Love one another. As I have loved you, is what you said, or do to others as you would have done to you. We are called to serve others, and in this service of worship, our serving takes the form of praying for others. And so, like the persistent widow, we persist in our prayers for others. Prayers for others outside this building, so, for this morning, I've unashamedly, as it turns out, dusted down my prayers from previous months, but I must be brief because Nick wants to finish part three before too long. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray again for peace. 
We pray for peace in Ukraine and other war-torn parts of the world. We pray for places, places which are short of food. We pray for the people there. We pray for those giving help and aid. Lord, we pray for the climate of this world and the good stewardship of the world's resources which we should be exercising. <coughs> Lord, we pray for the poor and the homeless of this country and all that is being done to put things right. And we pray for those in the health service who strive to do their work in spite of many obstacles and frustrations. Help us, Lord, to be persistent in our praying as a fellowship and as individuals. And as we persist, keeping on, keep on reminding us of your endless and persistent grace and love. Amen. We started with the picture of the Venice fog, and I want to come back to that image. If you look carefully, you'll be able to make out a series of stakes or piles that are called bricola. If you remember nothing else new today, you've learnt an Italian word. If you've been here before, you'll be familiar with my somewhat clunky analogies. The bricola mark out a safe route through shallow water and they're just far enough apart that you can find your way from one to the next no matter how thick the fog. Where or rather who is your fixed point? Who better to lead you through the fog than the one who appears in the cloud? Does the thought of returning to the fog of the valley fill you with dread? I don't know what the difficulties lie ahead, either for you or for me, and you may well say thank God for that. But the same God who spoke through the cloud is the one we see living in and through Jesus. And that can be the thing that gets us through. And going back to the bricola in the Venice Lagoon, you may be called to be a channel mark for someone going through the fog this week. Perhaps you know someone who's lost in the fog of life at the moment. And maybe this week, of all weeks, you will be able to share the hope you have in the one who acts as your guide. Be brave enough to do that. Amen. And so to our final hymn. I don't know how many of you use public transport, but you'll have heard that you wait ages for a bus, and then two come along at once. Fortunately, Pete chose this next hymn last week, and you've got the chance to sing it again. It's a great way of summing up the good news of Jesus. Do stay for the drink afterwards. So please, if you're willing and able, please stand as we sing at the name of Jesus. <laughs>
fog in the valley and may he encourage you to act as a guidepost for others during the coming days. Amen. Amen. Amen.